Hey there, friends. Are you ready to get a bit sophisticated today? I hope so, because I've got a fun science lesson for you today. So let's talk about adaptive radiation. Do you know what happens when a niche opens up in an ecosystem? Or niche, however you want to say that. Something comes in to fill that niche. But what happens if you have a lot of niches open? Sometimes you end up with adaptive radiation. No, it has nothing to do with chemical radiation. In this sense, radiation refers to the diversification of a group of animals. Adaptive radiation is when a single ancestral species diversifies into a ton of different new species that look different and fill different niches. This process tends to happen in places that are typically smaller and a little bit harder for different animals to colonize, so there's a ton of different niches open. Lakes and islands are a common place for adaptive radiation. Now, there are a few different really awesome examples of adaptive radiation, Darwin's finches being probably the most famous. In the Galapagos, an island chain, finches diversified, resulting in a bunch of different species with different morphologies, diet preferences, and habitat preferences. Basically, they all look a bit different and play different roles in their ecosystems. Some eat seeds and have large crushing beaks. Some eat insects and have thinner probing beaks. There's even a vampire finch that has a super sharp bill that's perfect for piercing so they can suck the blood of other animals. Darwin's finches are a great example of adaptive radiation. You can see their morphology differences so clearly and how those morphology differences make them more specialized for the niches that they fill in their ecosystems. Another example is the African rift lake cichlids. In just one of those African lakes, Lake Malawi, there are more cichlid species specifically than all freshwater fish species in the entirety of Europe. Come on, Europe, you gotta keep up. So clearly, when I say these fish diversified into many different species, I mean many different species. I did a video with SciShow on the adaptive radiation of these Lake Malawi cichlids, so if you're interested in watching that, I put that in the description below. But there's another example of adaptive radiation that I think doesn't quite get as much attention as maybe it should, and so I would like to highlight that today. If you love reptiles, this one's for you because this beautiful example of adaptive radiation is the Caribbean anoles. These are lizards in the genus Anolis, and in the Caribbean they have diversified like wild. I mean, someone had to fill all those island niches. <laughs> Niches? I don't know. They can be found on the island of Hispaniola, which is where you can find Haiti in the Dominican Republic. They can be found in Puerto Rico, Cuba, the Bahamas. I think you get the idea. They're all over the Caribbean. <laughs> and it all started when one species of anole from mainland Central or South America found its way to the islands, saw all of the open niches, and had an evolutionary heyday, resulting in around 150 new species of anoles. But that diversification didn't just happen one time. One ancestral species colonizing and diversifying has happened multiple times in the Caribbean. Now, the Caribbean anoles fit into six different ecomorphs. Ecomorphs being basically a description of the body type and the habitat preference. So let's go through the ecomorphs. We've got our crown giants at the tops of the trees. The trunk crown anoles that hang out towards the tops of the trees and also on the trunk. The trunk anole, which I feel is pretty self-explanatory. <laughs> the trunk ground anoles, which hang out towards the bottom ends of the trees and sometimes near the ground. You've got your grass bush anoles, which hang out in grasses and bushes. And then you have your twig anoles, which hang out in branches and twigs and look like, you guessed it, twigs. Truly, I don't really know why I tried to describe each of the ecomorphs as I named them, because I feel that the names describe the ecomorph quite well. <laughs> I also am so frustrated by the fact that there is a trunk crown and trunk ground because they sound too similar and when I'm in a conversation and I'm speaking quickly or someone else is speaking quickly, it's very easy to get lost as to what ecomorph anyone is actually talking about. <laughs> I can't even describe to you the amount of miscommunication that those two anole ecomorph names have caused between me and my partner who studies anoles. <laughs> Now, there may be several different species of a specific ecomorph on an island. However, there are also some ecomorphs that are missing from some of the islands. Not every island has every ecomorph, but for the ecomorphs that they do have, there could be several different species. Does that make sense? Also, typically, the bigger the island, the more species of anoles they have, which makes sense. More space, more niches, more lizards. But here's the wild thing. Anoles of a certain ecomorph on one island are often not closely related to anoles of that exact same ecomorph on a different island. Let me give you an example. The crown giants in Cuba are closely related to the grass bush anoles of Hispaniola. And the crown giants of Hispaniola are closely related to the twig anoles of Cuba. But the crown giants of Cuba and the crown giants of Hispaniola are not very closely related. Is this confusing? Yes. Yes, it is. But what it shows is that even within this wild world of adaptive radiation, and with there being multiple invasions of the islands by the anoles, we're also seeing convergent evolution, where lizards on different islands are converging onto the same habitat preferences and body types. So essentially, evolutionary history is repeating itself over and over again as we see these anoles converge on the same ecomorph multiple times across multiple islands. And that is so cool!
often in evolutionary biology, there's this question of if we started over, would we get the same result? And at least with the Caribbean anoles, it looks like potentially there's some evidence that this same thing is happening over and over again. So maybe we would get the same result if we started all over. I recently went on vacation with my partner who, again, studies anoles, among many other things. That man wears many hats and is involved in many projects and I just can't keep up anymore. <laughs> anyway, we ended up going to the Dominican Republic partly because of their great anole diversity. We saw a ton of different individuals, but we only saw three different species. However, each of those species was a different ecomorph and that was really cool to see. We saw trunk crown anoles and we only saw them up high. They were hanging out in roof structures. They're green and they have a longer snout. We believe that the species we saw is Anolis calanus. We also saw a trunk anole and we only ever saw them on, you guessed it, tree trunks. And something notable about them is that their forelimbs and hind limbs tend to be a similar length. We believe that that species was Anolis disticus. They were always perched so well. And finally, we also saw trunk ground anoles, typically near the bottoms of the tree trunks and they've got very long hind legs. Now, this species could have been either Anolis hispaniola or Anolis higui, but based on the location of where we found those, we think it's probably Anolis higui. All of the anoles that we saw were incredibly fast, and for some of them, it was really hard to get up close to get a good picture because they scurried away very quickly. Scurry is a fantastic word, by the way, and I think we need to be using it more often. <laughs> now, while we wish that we had seen a couple more different species of the anoles, we were very excited with the species that we did see, and it was really cool to see those three ecomorphs behaving in ways that we have read about and ways that we expected them to behave. Not only because of where we were able to find them based on their ecomorph, but also because Anolis higui is known to have males perched higher than females, and we were able to get one really good picture of a male perched higher than a female. So to see that in action and get it in one good picture was really, really cool. Adaptive radiation in general will never cease to amaze me. And the way that these lizards found their way from the mainland into these islands, found all of these open niches and just radiated to become so many amazing different species is so incredible. And I will never get over this convergent evolution hidden and nested within all of this divergent evolution. That is just wild to me. It is truly mind blowing. Evolution's dope. So if you ever find yourself in the Caribbean, keep your eyes out for some anoles. See how many ecomorphs you can find. It's like Pokemon, you gotta collect them all. Metaphorically, of course. Please don't take the lizards home. <laughs> if you're interested in doing a bit more of a deep dive on the adaptive radiation of these lizards, or just interested in these lizards in general, I have included a couple links down in the description. One link is actually a blog written and maintained by anole scientists that has probably every anole inquiry you could possibly have. So go check that one out. Thank you for joining me today. I hope you had fun and learned something new. And as always, have a great day and stay sharky or I guess lizardly, my friends.